So welcome everyone to the second webinar in the 2021 Virtual Cordoma Community Conference Series. I am Shannon Lozinski, Director of Patient Services at the Cordoma Foundation. I will be moderating today's webinar and um, we are really glad to be able to host this virtual conference series this year in place of an in-person event that we um, decided we would postpone um, to make sure everyone is in a safe place. Uh, the, the first webinar of the series held in April focused on pain management. You can find a recording of that one in the webinar library on our website, cordoma.org. And you can also go to the virtual community conference page of the website to find dates and topics for the rest of the webinars this year. Today, we're going to be talking about cancer related fatigue. We know that fatigue is something that the vast majority of people with cancer experience. And that is true for Cordoma patients as well. Fatigue related to cancer is approached a bit differently than other types of fatigue because of the unique factors that cause it and contribute to it, such as certain cancer treatments. Um, but many times the exact causes and therefore how to manage and treat it are hard to pinpoint. So uh, getting the right care is important. Um, our goal for the webinar today is to help you learn more about cancer related fatigue what can help you manage it, and how to access the right care. So to that end, I'd like to welcome and introduce our speakers. We are fortunate to have two speakers with us today who are experts in managing fatigue. Dr. Eric Rowland is an assistant professor of medicine as well as a palliative care specialist and medical oncology physician. He very recently made a move to Oregon Health and Science University from Massachusetts General Hospital. And Dr. Rowan's practice focuses on helping patients feel as well as possible during and after cancer treatment by identifying interventions that can help alleviate the symptoms and challenges they're experiencing. Um, he will be talking with us about the possible causes of cancer-related fatigue and the ways it can be managed. Dr. Pune Fazeli is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine as well as the director of the neuroendocrinology unit and medical director of the pituitary center of excellence at the University of Pittsburgh Me Medical Center. Um, Dr. Fazelli will be talking with us about the role of hormonal imbalances in cancer related fatigue. We are very happy to have you both with us. Um, Dr. Roland, you will be leading us off. So I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, connect with all of you. Um, as you all are aware, cancer-related fatigue is a uh, very common um, uh, symptom, and unfortunately, it's pretty complicated. Uh, but I would like to um, present um, today, review uh, the causes of cancer-related fatigue, um, describe how clinicians, I'm sorry, next slide describe how clinicians approach cancer-related fatigue, and then um, discuss the evidence-based interventions to prove this uh, symptom um, so we can really focus on what we can do. Um, next slide. So unfortunately, the causes of fatigue even outside of cancer are um, many-fold. And um, I've listed a few, um, which are um, things I see most commonly. Um, as an oncologist, you know, it's always important to recognize that uncontrolled cancer itself can um, cause immense fatigue. And even in the incurable setting, when we start cancer treatment, patients often feel better and are surprised by that. Additionally, if you, you can feel immense fatigue, if you um, have pain out of control, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, name the symptom, if it's poorly controlled, you're not gonna get the rest that you need um, and uh, that will further contribute to fatigue. Uh, we also see um, anemia or low uh, red blood cell counts. Um, uh, we have been learning over time that there uh, are certain blood counts that we are that are most ideal, um, and if you get below those parameters, sometimes patients can really benefit from um, blood transfusions or even an iron transfusion um, if that is uh, most likely. 
Um, drug side effects and every single drug you take, I'm sure you're aware, has multiple uh, associated side effects. Um, so really being aware of that, um, that of course includes our, uh, our newer treatments. Um, later on, uh, you'll hear more about the endocrinopathies, but uh, thyroid abnormalities is very common, uh, high calcium. And then uh, the things that I end up talking to patients a lot about is um, uh, their activity, uh, how much they're up and moving, uh, nutrition, and then um, most of times, the answer to why am I feeling fatigued is, um, you know, all of the above. It's many of these factors are multifactorial. Next slide. So the mantra for clinicians um, to treat cancer-related fatigue is we try to identify the causes and treat what we can. Um, next slide. And um, I just want to break this down so you understand how we as clinicians think about this. So we categorize uh, fatigue by time. So acute uh, is a fatigue that's occurred less than three months and chronic is past three months. And the broad general categories that I think about are um, toxic or metabolic, um, treatment related, and then cancer related. Uh, for both of those time periods. Next slide. And um, specific to cancer-related fatigue, uh, we know it's common. We know it's very common to be multifactorial. And the best evidence approach, approach intervention is low intensity exercise. And we have tried many, many things, uh, but it, it comes back to a little bit of exercise every day is by far the best intervention. Um, that, of course, is very hard to hear when you don't feel good and, you know, you uh, don't want to get up and move. Um, so we'll talk about some strategies to help achieve that. Uh, additionally, uh, we have tried um, all sorts of pharmacologic approaches. And these have had really mixed benefits. Um, a common approach is to provide stimulants, um, stimulants like methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, or some of the longer acting preparations. Unfortunately, uh, these stimulants uh, cause a loss of appetite. Uh, they can cause insomnia. They can also cause heart palpitations. Uh, so pa patients with um, anxiety or heart disease uh, really need to be careful with this. And unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues just feel this overwhelming need to do something and provide these stimulants. Um, and I just want everyone to know that we have many randomized controlled trial uh, looking at all sorts of flavors of stimulants and unfortunately, there's no benefit uh, over placebo. Um, another uh, approach is to use uh, corticosteroids. And um, the one we use frequently is the long acting form of uh, corticosteroid called dexamethasone. Um, and in fact, uh, these, this drug is used uh, frequently to treat many symptoms for cancer. Um, given in short uh, intervals, it is actually very effective. Um, unfortunately, when you use it uh, usually for 10 days or more, uh, people start to experience more of the side effects than the benefits. And so, um, you know, this is something that I, that I have prescribed um, as long as it is not contraindicated with the other treatments the patient is receiving. Um, but I usually give it in short bursts, which my uh, patients know that we, I call um, holiday decks. So if you have a, uh, a great um, event coming up and you want a little extra energy uh, to see your grandson softball game or whatever, then I will give usually one to three days of dexamethasone, um, trying to maximize those benefits and limit the uh, side effects. Another intervention, um, that Deborah Barton and colleagues at a Mayo Clinic uh, demonstrated was the use of American ginseng. Um, this isn't ginseng that you just buy over the counter, but it's actually from a co-op uh, co in um, Wisconsin, 
where they could guarantee the, the quality of the ginseng. And patients with cancer and severe fatigue did benefit uh, from uh, taking a maritime ginseng, usually for more than four to eight weeks. But again, that's something that you also need to discuss with your uh, treating um, oncologist. Next slide. So in our country, um, I, I think that there is um, a trend to really focusing on drugs and what uh, we can put in our mouths. Um, and we're expecting just that uh, sudden improvement and there's gotta be something out there that someone has that's gonna make this better. And so we um, unfortunately lean more towards those approaches rather than thinking about some of the exercise and mindful uh, based strategies in approaching cancer-related fatigue. Next slide. Um, you know, we, we, if we talk about fatigue, we also have to talk about sleep. They are uh, uh, connected. And insomnia in cancer patients is incredibly common. And there's you know, many types of insomnia, and I've listed them here. The most common being uh, frequent awakening. Um, but this is, a, you know, if you're not sleeping well, obviously you're going to feel tired the next day. Next slide. And the predisposing factors for insomnia are usually uh, women um, greater than uh, 60 to 65 years of age um, who may have a medical, um, psychiatric, or substance abuse disorder. Um, in my experience, um, insomnia is frequently a, a symptom associated with poorly controlled anxiety. And I'll even have patients that say, I'm not anxious, I just can't sleep. Um, but it, <laughs> when you really get down to it, what they're, uh, what's ca causing them issues of falling asleep is just um, their mind racing about um, things every, you know, related to their cancer, their treatment, or just life in general. Uh, patients who don't move, if you're getting up and peeing all the time, or if you have diarrhea, you know, this is obviously going to um, impact your ability to sleep. Um, patients with obesity and related sleep apnea also have issues. And then um, night sweats. Next slide. So the, the formal diagnosis of insomnia is, uh, is described here. And again, you see that acute versus chronic um, three-month three month, uh, division. Uh, but you have difficulty going to sleep, maintaining sleep, early wakening, and it's usually more than three times a week. And you're having daytime consequences of this despite an adequate opportunity to sleep. And you don't have any other sleep disorders that explain this. And um, you know, I would say the most common is sleep apnea. Next slide. And uh, you'll hear uh, your treating clinician talk about sleep hygiene. Unfortunately, the data to, to support uh, sleep hygiene is very um, limited, and most sleep experts don't even believe in it. But I do think there's some practical strategies that make sense. Um, so, you know, spending too much time in bed, especially when you're not sleeping, is not a good idea. Um, Frequent napping during the day, uh, patients that sleep during the day and then end up having to, to be awake at night, uh, also known as the vampire schedule. Um, we're all uh, very fixed to our phones and TVs and that ill time light exposure can um, interrupt uh, the sleep wake cycle. And um, you know, really the only thing that you should be doing in bed is sleeping. So things that are engaging such as watching TV, reading, um, you know, using phone um, apps, et cetera, really should, um, you shouldn't do in that kind of sacred space of your bed. Next slide. So in general, these are the three ways that I think about it. Um, there's a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy uh, focused on insomnia, and you'll hear of it called CBTI. Um, this is uh, becoming increasingly available across medical centers and um, is by far the most um, effective in combination with low to moderate exercise. 
Uh, when we talk about low to moderate exercise, we're not talking about a half marathon. We're talking about 10 minutes twice a day of something. If that's walking, if that's using a stationary bike, uh, yoga, even chair yoga, these are all ways to um, really improve that sense of fatigue. And then when we think about um, uh, pharmacologic approaches to uh, fatigue and insomnia specifically, the only two that really are evidence-based are melatonin and trazodone. Um, and melatonin is really used to reset um, the internal clock to help you fall asleep. Um, it is not something that should be taken chronically. Um, it should just be um, just as needed to get on a good sleep schedule and then, and then stopped. Um, it doesn't really have any uh, long-term side effects that we're aware of and is generally safe. Uh, trazodone, on the other hand, is an um, older drug um, that initially was an antidepressant, but actually has, causes more sedation. And studies show that it's actually quite effective and safe in patients who are chronically um, or severely ill. However, it often has a long half-life, and so people might feel a little um, tired the next day if they take it too late at night. Next slide. And then we also need to think about nutrition. So um, I think it's incredibly important to be very clear about the difference be differences between starvation and something called cachexia. Cachexia is a hypermetabolic uh, disorder associated with um, many diseases, including cancer. And um, both, um, so with starvation, your body may or may not actually increase um, your lack of appetite. But in cachexia, um, which again is associated with the cancer itself, it often causes that loss of appetite or anorexia. Um, with cachexia, we also see a huge increase in your body's metabolism. So you are just burning through calories just ha with your body's um, reaction to the underlying treatment and cancer, whereas with starvation, that metabolism is unchanged. And then we also see that um, increased calories can improve uh, starvation, but may or may not improve outcomes in cachexia. And so um, I think it's all, all very important for not only patients, but also caregivers to really become familiar with this term. And it will actually help um, mitigate a lot of the internal stressors between patients and caregivers around the issues of food. Next slide. And, um, you know, again, this desire to do something, um, the two agents that are um, most frequently prescribed include um, magestral acetate, which is a hormone derivative. Um, and there's been multiple studies looking at this. It does improve appetite, it does improve weight gain, but it is also associated with edema or swelling of the uh, legs and arms, um, thromboembolism or blood clots. It can even cause issues with adrenal insufficiency. So it's not without its risks, and it's not something I routinely uh, prescribe. Um, and then we also have corticosteroids, um, such as dexamethasone. Um, they do improve appetite um, as well as fatigue, but they also have tons of side effects uh, when used um, long-term, such as increased um, uh, glucose, poor wound healing, it can even make um, the proximal strength of the muscles get uh, worse over time, and uh, it goes on and on. I think the number of side effects is greater than 50. So, you know, we really try to um, use these in short bursts uh, rather than using them chronically. Next slide. And then I'm always asked about um, medical cannabis. And usually the people that are asking about medical cannabis are usually the kids of elderly patients um, uh, who are not uh, accustomed to the side effects of medical cannabis. If people use uh, medical cannabis or cannabis recreationally and know how their body responds to cannabis, um, you know, we would have a discussion around effective strategies on how to use it. However, 
using cannabis um, causes fatigue. You feel uh, tired. Um, you may have improved appetite, but you're not going to have that pep in your step after um, using cannabis. So if you are going to use it, um, you know, make sure that you're treating um, uh, oncologists as aware and that uh, you're talking to someone who knows uh, the, the best and safest ways to use it. Next. And so what we can do, um, I really feel like it's important that everyone recognize that there is no magic pill for fatigue. Um, I want everyone to avoid Dr. Google. Um, you know, I, if there's a lot of information out there, um, but if it sounds too good to be true, it really is. Um, and so when we talk about eating, I say if it looks good and you can keep it down, go for it. And, you know, and avoid extreme or fad diets. Um, get engaged and get a referral to uh, nutrition or a registered dietitian as soon as you can. They're great allies, uh, but often a limited resource across medical systems. So you may have to wait a bit. Physical therapists also are outstanding and um, can not only help guide you in um, activities, but help guide you in safe activities. Um, and just continuing to move in any way that you can that is safe. I also want everyone to remember that the mind and body are connected and uh, focusing on things like anxiety and depression is equally as important as uh, treating the underlying disease. And um, getting help um, with those is a sign of strength, in my opinion. Next slide. And really, um, this is a very complicated issue and you just need to team up with as many people as you possibly can. And I've listed some um, experts here um, and most of them are available um, in your uh, medical setting, but um, experts in pain, palliative care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutritionists, um, you know, learning more, getting resources around um, uh, education, supporting caregivers who often are really struggling watching their uh, loved one go through all this. And then, um, you know, as a clinical um, researcher, you know, seeking clinical trials that may have benefit uh, specifically for symptom management. Now I'd like to pass it over. Thank you so much, Dr. Roland. That was, uh, that was very, that last slide, I think, shows it all that there's so many factors um, and things that that need to be pieced together to make sure that it's addressed well. So um, that was very informative. Thank you. Um, and now we will turn it over to Dr. Fazelli. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. And touched on many of the points that I will raise also. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. That's Excellent. Great. So um, I'd like to start by just discussing pituitary physiology. Um, and many of the things that Dr. Roland touched on will come up during this talk as well. So the pituitary gland is the master control center or the master gland. And what the pituitary does is it signals other glands in the body to make or release hormones. For example, the pituitary makes ACTH, which is a hormone which signals the adrenal glands to make cortisol. And Dr. Roland referred to dexamethasone or corticosteroids, and uh, those are, are a form of cortisol. The pituitary also makes thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, which signals the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. FSH and LH are two other pituitary hormones that signal the ovary and the testes. And in women, FSH and LH are necessary for a normal menstrual cycle. And in men, normal FSH and LH signaling are necessary to make testosterone and sperm. The pituitary gland also makes prolactin, which is a hormone which typically increases during pregnancy and is important for breast milk production in nursing women. And lastly, the pituitary gland also makes growth hormone. 
And this is a sagittal or sideways MRI view. And you can see the patient's nose over here. Um, and this is a normal sized and shaped pituitary gland. And the pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus, which is a gland that sits above the pituitary gland by a stalk. And uh, the, the hypothalamus sends signals to the pituitary gland through this stalk. Now, how does this relate to chordomas? So the clivus sits near the pituitary gland and clival chordomas, which represent about one third of chordomas, can grow into the pituitary and disrupt and interfere with pituitary hormone function. So here you can see that the normal pituitary architecture has been disrupted. And this can lead to pituitary hormone insufficiency. Now, importantly, in pituitary hormone insufficiency can be associated with the chordoma itself, like in this case, or it can also be the result of treatment for the chordoma, including radiation or surgery. And therefore, it's very important that pituitary hormone insufficiency be evaluated for both at the time of diagnosis and also after treatment. And in the case of radiation therapy, evaluating for pituitary hormone insufficiency should be part of the long-term monitoring plan because it can develop many years after radiation therapy. So what are the symptoms of pituitary hormone insufficiency? So one of the main symptoms of pituitary hormone insufficiency is fatigue. As I mentioned, one of the hormones made by the pituitary gland is ACTH, and ACTH will um, lead to uh, it will stimulate the adrenal gland to make cortisol. And again, cortisol is a corticosteroid. And so Dr. Roland a couple of times mentioned dexamethasone and dexamethasone is a cortisol-like substance. Therefore, disruption of ACTH production will lead to adrenal insufficiency or low cortisol levels. And symptoms of adrenal insufficiency or lack of cortisol production include fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, and importantly, adrenal insufficiency can be life-threatening if it's untreated. Therefore, it's very important that adrenal insufficiency be evaluated for and treated. So another hormone made by the pituitary gland is thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. And TSH signals the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone. So disruption of TSH production will lead to hypothyroidism and low thyroid hormone levels. And signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism include fatigue, dry skin and dry hair, constipation, and anemia, which is another um, factor that contributes to fatigue that Dr. Roland had mentioned. It, anemia is low blood cell counts, low red blood cell counts. Now, what's important to note about hypothyroidism is that the most common cause of hypothyroidism is a thyroid gland that is not functioning properly. And the low thyroid hormone levels, when the thyroid gland is not functioning properly, will send a signal back to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will in turn increase TSH levels. And these high TSH levels are trying their hardest to make the thyroid gland work, but it's simply not responding. Therefore, when a primary care doctor or a family practice doctor is screening a patient for hypothyroidism, he or she will check a TSH level. And in the vast majority of cases of hypothyroidism, probably greater than 95% of the time, the TSH level will be high. But in this case, the TSH level will not be high because the problem is actually not the thyroid gland, but instead it's the pituitary gland, which is not sending out the proper TSH signal. Therefore, it's very important that patients be evaluated for hypothyroidism by a pituitary specialist, because if only a TSH level is checked, the diagnosis of hypothyroidism could be missed entirely. So other hormones made by the pituitary gland include FSH and LH, and disruption of these hormones will lead to low levels of estrogen and testosterone. And signs and symptoms of hypogonadism or estrogen and testosterone deficiency include fatigue, decreased muscle mass, low libido, vaginal dryness or vaginal atrophy in women, and decreased bone density. Now, it's important to note that not all individuals with hypogonadism will be treated or will need treatment. For example, postmenopausal women have low estrogen levels because of menopause anyway, and we typically don't replace estrogen in that population. 
Um, there's also a literature suggesting that some chordomas may have sex steroid receptors like estrogen receptors. And therefore it's always important for me as an endocrinologist to discuss my treatment plans with the patient's other treating physicians and make sure they're okay with what I'm recommending. So another pituitary hormone is prolactin. And again, prolactin is important for breast milk production in nursing women. Now, prolactin production is controlled by a hormone made in the hypothalamus, and that hormone is dopamine. And what the hypothalamus does, so the hypothalamus is a gland that sits right above the pituitary gland and is connected to the pituitary gland by a stalk. And uh, dopamine travels from the hypothalamus through this stalk through this stock into the pituitary gland and attaches to the D2 or dopamine receptors on the lactotroph cells, which are the prolactin producing cells and inhibits or suppresses prolactin secretion. So therefore anything that interferes with the ability of dopamine to get from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland and travel, travel through that stock and get to the pituitary gland will cause a high prolactin level. So therefore, a clival chordoma, which you can see here, which is um, interfering and disrupting the stock, will lead to a high prolactin level or hyperprolactinemia, which disrupts the production of another hormone made in the hypothalamus, which is called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone is the hormone that signals the pituitary gland to make FSH and LH. And so therefore, FSH and LH production are going to be disrupted. And now you're going to have another cause of low estrogen estrogen and testosterone levels or hypogonadism. And therefore all the signs and symptoms of hypogonadism that I just described, including fatigue, can also occur in patients just because of a high prolactin level. The pituitary gland also makes growth hormone and disruption of growth hormone production by the pituitary gland leads to growth hormone deficiency. The signs and symptoms of growth hormone deficiency include fatigue, a decrease in bone density, and a decrease in muscle mass. Now, it's important to note that we don't usually treat individuals with a history of chordomas with growth hormone because, as its name implies, it can stimulate growth. But I do think it's important to know if individuals have growth hormone deficiency because we can potentially tweak some of our other hormone replacement doses to be beneficial. Now, all of the hormones I've discussed so far are made by the anterior or the front part of the pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary, which you can see here, is indicated by this bright spot on this sagittal or sideways MRI image, makes a hormone called antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Now, antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that helps us hold on to water. And therefore, if you're not making antidiuretic hormone, you urinate out everything that you drink. Um, sometimes clival chordomas can interfere with the production of antidiuretic hormone, which can lead to needing to drink and urinate free, very frequently. And as Dr. Roland described, this can be a cause of insomnia or just an inability to sleep. Because you can imagine that if you're up, um, if patients are up one to two times an hour because they need to urinate and drink fluids, that can be exhausting. Um, and this can be easily treated by giving back antidiuretic hormone. Therefore, as you can see, particularly with clival chordomas, disruption of pituitary hormone production can lead to fatigue. Therefore, it's very important that patients be evaluated for pituitary hormone insufficiency. And it's important that this be done at the time of diagnosis and also after treatment with surgery and also after treatment with radiation and that it be, be continued long-term in patients with a history of radiation therapy because pituitary hormone insufficiency can develop many years after a radiation treatment. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was a lot of really helpful information. Um, and we have some questions that have come in um, already. Appreciate those. So, um, so I think we should just uh, jump right into uh, the Q&A. Um, Dr. Fazelli, I'll start with you about those evaluations. Um, are, are those evaluations for hormone levels, um, are they automatically 
done at follow-ups for patients that you're aware of or um, what, what should patients ask for or look for to make sure that those kinds of things are being done? Um, so at the time of diagnosis, the patient, especially a patient with a clival chordoma, should be evaluated by an endocrinologist with some pituitary specialty. Um, and they, what we will do at the time of diagnosis is we will evaluate a patient for adrenal insufficiency, for hypothyroidism, um, and for diabetes insipidus or a lack of antidiuretic hormone production. Um, it's particularly important that a patient be evaluated before surgery because if they do have adrenal insufficiency, that needs to be treated before, before surgery. Um, after surgery, about six weeks after surgery, uh, when the patient sees the endocrinologist again, they will have a full pituitary hormone evaluation again at that point in time. And then usually before radiation therapy and at least every six months to a year thereafter, they should be evaluated for pituitary hormone insufficiency. And that's all done through blood tests? It's done through blood tests. Um, in, for adrenal insufficiency, we do need to do, um, we sometimes need to do a more specialized test, which can be done by an endocrinologist. But for the most part, many of these tests are blood tests. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Roland, can you hear us okay? You're still muted, okay. Yep. There you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I wondered if you could, uh, considering that you are um, uh, part of your practice is is involved with palliative care, there are sometimes uh, there's there's still uh, we've seen like not enough information out there about what palliative care is and how beneficial it could be. Could you speak on that just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Um... Despite now, I think uh, 10 randomized controlled trials um, in patients with incurable and curable cancer, which all demonstrate improved quality of life, um, improved coping, improved symptom control, decreased caregiver burden, um, there still exists this idea that palliative care is end of life care. So that is an old approach. And if you are working with um, a clinical team that still uh, believes in this antiquated model, um, I'd really encourage you to, um, to connect with um, a palliative care group that understands that palliative care is based on need and not prognosis. Um, palliative care is a team um, of experts, which it usually includes uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, chaplains, pharmacists, um, and they're a specialized team that works together. So it's an added layer of support to um, your other medical team. And the benefits are that um, they might be able to see you um, more frequently or at different uh, intervals rather than your other team. And then just know that their involvement has never created harm. We've never seen any evidence that having palliative care engaged early causes any type of harm. Thank you. And related to that, considering palliative care looks at many different issues affecting quality of life, can you talk a little bit about um, the inner, I guess it would be an interplay really between pain and on, you know, ongoing after, for instance, multiple spine surgeries, um, that the pain that they experience is, is causing so much fatigue and um, how palliative care possibly could address something like that. Yeah, I, I see it time and time again that poorly controlled pain just exhausts the body. And I've even had situations where I finally get a patient's pain under control and they end up sleeping for like three days. And the, uh, the caregiver calls me and says, what's going on? And then I say, well, can you wake them up? And yeah, they're easily aroused. And it's just, it just is, it just shows you that once you get that pain under control, just how exhausted your pain really can be. Um, it's a bit complicated in different medical systems in terms of who the pain experts are. Palliative care is one of those. Um, you also have pain experts through the anesthesia pain service. Um, 
And then the question is kind of where in the course of your illness. So usually during active treatment, that's usually when palliative care will get involved. And then if you're kind of having that pain that's lasting for more than three months, you want to get involved with someone who can follow you long term. Um, fortunately, we just don't have enough um, services in palliative care to continue that survivorship uh, space in most clinical settings. Um, but we can think about, um, you know, things outside of medication. So, you know, opioids are one option, but there's also um, interventional pain um, options that really should be explored. And um, you just need to find out who those experts are in your setting. Thank you. And with pain management, I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that we did a webinar uh, two months ago on pain management. So that's a, a nice resource as well. Um, and then there's some pain management information on our uh, website um, also. Um, so kind of going in the theme, one more question for you, Dr. Roland, um, that is kind of a, a multifactorial piece of, of fatigue. Um, someone asked if you could speak a little bit more on cachexia, just uh, what is it, what are the, the causes, and um, how it plays with everything. Yeah, so um, cachexia, again, is a syndrome. It's um, a syndrome associated with loss of appetite, the, uh, weight loss, decreased muscle, increased treatment-related toxicity, poor quality of life. Um, and it affects everything, even, you know, our hormones are a big piece of that. Um, and um, a great resource for folks who want to learn more about it is the American Society of Clinical Oncology uh, recently published uh, the first guidelines um, about that, which also include um, patient facing information. Um, but in general, it's important to recognize um, that this, uh, the syndrome increases your metabolism, decreases your appetite, and even if you force yourself to eat, um, you're still going to lose uh, weight in the setting. And the best way to, um, to treat cachexia is to treat the underlying disease, um, you know, when possible. Um, but I think um, where I see it being very important is for patients and caregivers to understand that some of these things are out of their control. And I see a lot of tension between caregivers and patients around the issues of food. And it can even become quite a battle um, where you know, providing food is a clear sign that you're doing a good job as a caregiver. And then eating that food says you're being a good patient. But um, in this setting, that might not be um, appropriate or even feasible. And so um, we need to find other ways uh, to uh, demonstrate our, our love uh, for our, our loved ones when they just really can't participate in, in eating. Thank you. So Dr. Fazelli, over to you. Um, this is a great question. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the how patients with clival cordoma are often affected by endocrinology issues. Um, and the question is, uh, a couple questions about this really. Um, is it possible for those who have cordoma tumors in other locations on the spine to experience adrenal insufficiency um, or, or other things either during treatments like radiation or, or after? Um, and, and how does that come into play? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, hypothyroidism is very common in patients with or without cancer and with or without cordoma. So um, if somebody has hypothyroidism, that would be, they, they could develop hypothyroidism independently of their cordoma. Um, patients can develop adrenal insufficiency, like Dr. Roland mentioned, if they're treated with medications that are used to treat cachexia like Megase, um, or if they're, if they're treated with high dose glucocorticoids or corticosteroids like dexamethasone, they can in turn develop adrenal insufficiency. He mentioned that he only likes to treat with short courses of dexamethasone, but if you're treated with uh, dexamethasone 
at high doses for long periods of time, you could develop adrenal insufficiency when you stop the dexamethasone. So I do think that patients, even without clival cordomas, are at risk for developing adrenal insufficiency. Um, hypothyroidism is very common, and so there that is a that is something that can develop in patients um, with or without clival cordomas as well. And so those are things that should be evaluated for in any patient who's presenting with fatigue. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, uh, another question about uh, different hormones and, and imbalances. If, if only one particular hormone is out of range, but all the others are normal, do you usually, would that indicate treatment or um, what does that depend on? Yes. Um, so if a patient has adrenal insufficiency and only adrenal insufficiency, we treat. If, if a patient has hypothyroidism and only hypothyroidism, we do treat. Um, as I mentioned, we don't typically treat growth hormone deficiency in patients with a history of a malignancy um, because it can potentially cause growth. Um, if, if there is still a little bit of tumor left. Um, and again, in postmenopausal women, for instance, we don't usually treat um, estrogen deficiency because that is normal for, for the postmenopausal state. But um, for the other hormone deficiencies, for antidiuretic hormone deficiency, what we call diabetes insipidus, for adrenal insufficiency, for hypothyroidism, even if it's just that one hormone, we'll treat because um, those, are, those have significant effects. Okay, and what about uh, prolactin specifically? That's one you didn't mention. Is that one always treated as well? Yes. Yeah, so um, if a patient has a high prolactin level and they are either a male or a premenopausal woman, um, we will treat the high prolactin level generally because again, it can cause hypogonadism. It can be a cause of a low estrogen and testosterone level. It can also cause symptoms like in women, it will cause breast milk production potentially. Um, and so we do treat high prolactin levels in certain populations. In postmenopausal women, for example, we don't treat high prolactin levels because um, they are already estrogen deficient. So it's not, it typically doesn't cause an issue. Okay, I understand. Thank you. And this, the, the point you're making about growth hormone, um, this question has uh, come up a couple of times um, at our community conferences and just uh, in our, with our patient navigators, people have asked us about, um, about hormones. And if uh, chordoma is known to be a hormone sensitive uh, tumor type, and if treating with any hormones is a bad idea. And of course there's, as you, you know, it's clear there's a range of hormones, um, uh, but are there, is there um, evidence? You mentioned that hormone, human growth hormone could cause tumor to grow. Um, is there strong evidence uh, of that or, and, and, and is that the case for any other hormones? That's a great question. So, um, you know, chordomas are fairly rare. And so we don't have a lot of experience and it's generally thought that we should not be treating with growth hormone. So I don't know. Um, we don't know, I think as a community, whether actually using growth hormone will cause chordomas to grow. Um, but because of the risk um, and the potential risk outweighing the benefit, we don't generally prescribe growth hormone in, in that population. There are, um, there's some old literature and some old data suggesting that chordomas may have sex hormone receptors, um, for instance, estrogen receptors or androgen receptors or progesterone receptors. We also don't know actually whether um, th those receptors and uh, if we give back estrogen, if that will affect chordoma growth. In fact, there was some data suggesting that um, women were more likely um, to have fatal chordomas as compared to males, suggesting that potentially estrogen is a bad thing, whereas the fact that these chordomas may have estrogen receptors may suggest that um, estrogen, uh, you know, estrogen may cause these tumors to grow. So we don't, we don't have a lot of information. We generally feel that we should treat people with hormone deficiencies um, 
for their hormone deficiencies in terms of replacing testosterone in a male who has a very low testosterone level. Um, if we find that the chordoma starts to grow in the setting of treating um, the testosterone deficiency, we may pull back or at least lower the dose of testosterone and, and try to try to achieve a balance. But I think um, we don't unfortunately have a lot of information about um, what hormone uh, what hormones can cause these to grow. But I will say that treating adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism, if we don't treat those, those can be life-threatening and they have significant side effects and symptoms. So those are a no-brainer. Treating antidiuretic hormone deficiency or treating diabetes insipidus, also a no-brainer. But the, the other uh, hormones, growth hormone becomes more of a quality of life factor. We don't generally um, treat patients. And there are, there are hormonal adjustments I can make. For instance, if we treat with transdermal estrogen in a premenopausal woman, woman that can keep IGF-1 levels higher than if we treat with oral estrogen. So there are tweaks that we can make to try to preserve um, as much hormone production as possible. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, yeah, and as, as, as an oncologist, I just would like to point out that although chordomas are, are very, very rare, um, the most common cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer are hormone-driven processes. And so the last thing you want to do is actually add uh, the possibility of uh, another cancer on top of everything you're dealing with. So um, this is a situation where I think uh, getting on the internet and, and buying things without advice from uh, doctors could actually cause a lot of harm. Yeah, fair point. Um, okay, so a couple questions for you, Dr. Roland. Um, um, this one's kind of specific, but I think it's, it's a very good question because uh, others might experience something similar. Um, so a situation of a, of a person who does uh, have some good amount of uh, physical activity um, in their lives where um, they work out with a trainer and also do some water exercises, but um, walking is just, just simply walking is very fatiguing um, and, you know, could be due to, um, or I guess some of the other factors are spinal surgery, maybe hardware. Um, and how do you, I guess that's sort of like a focused question, right? Is if you experience fatigue in this particular setting, what can you do to focus on, on that and increase that endurance? Well, so I think the question is, um, you know, related to the type of activity. And, and so, um, yeah. you know, our studies have just been limited um, based on what we can really pull off in these studies. Um, so walking has been a major intervention and of course, um, uh, light resistance exercise with exercise bands. Um, but, um, you know, water, um, ex water based exercise, especially when you have, uh, chronic pain or, uh, uh, history of spinal surgeries is outstanding. Um, you know, and, and I think the, the key that I tell my patients is that if you really enjoy something and it makes you feel better, um, keep, keep going and doing what you can, um, don't focus on the things that you can't build off what um, what you can do and um, you know as far as as walking um, you know if that's causing a lot of pain and just limiting your mobility you know that is something that I think um, you really need to uh, review with not only a physical therapist and potentially an occupational therapist who might have a nice uh, walking or something to help you but even um, you know reviewing that with uh, spine experts um, to see if there's something there that is actually needs to be uh, addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, one about uh, diet, one of the, you mentioned avoiding extreme fad diets. Um, one of the popular diets that's around now being keto. Is there any, any evidence relationship, anything that you've observed um, with the, the keto diet in particular and fatigue? Um, so yes, um, I've had patients that have just completely restricted um, all sugars as much and carbohydrates as much as possible. 
Um, and um, it can cause mental fogginess and fatigue if done in an extreme way. Um, I think it's important for people to remember that the primary uh, food source or a dry um, uh, energy source for the brain is glucose. Um, so, um, you know, I think anything done in an extreme way, I mean, you can take name, name that fruit, name that vegetable. If you only do that and it's not balanced, you're going to lead to problems. Um, the, the role of the registered dietitian, I think, is incredibly important here because um, people give advice um, because they mean well and they, they want to love on you and, and give you something that you can control in this really uncontrollable situation. Um, but what, what we observe time and time again is if you take things to an extreme, it actually leads to um, limiting our ability to treat your cancer, more toxicity, um, and decreased quality of life. Um, so when people approach you about these things, and I've seen all sorts of things, um, you know, really um, engage your uh, clinician, and if they're unaware of it, um, seek some nutritional expertise. So I'm just noticing we are um, at the hour, um, but uh, we've uh, previously agreed that if we had some more questions, we, we would keep going. So hopefully attendees can stay with us as well. We've just got about four more questions. Um, so let's keep going to, to try to get through those in the next few minutes. Um, there's a question about um, osteoporosis and how that relates to uh, fatigue and, and how that's managed. So I think Dr. Fazzoli, that'd probably be a question for you. Sure, absolutely. So um, osteoporosis can be a side effect of, for instance, high doses of dexamethasone. Dr. Roland mentioned that the dexamethasone, especially when given in high doses, has any number of side effects. I think he said there were probably at least 50. Um, and we do see things like hyperglycemia and a decrease in bone density and bone mass. And I think, you know, Osteoporosis in and of itself may not lead to fatigue, but it puts you at a very high risk of fracture. And a fracture can be debilitating, and that can be a cause of not being able to do the low intensity exercises Dr. Roland mentioned and can contribute to fatigue long term as well. Thank you. Um, let's see. If we can get through. Um, quick, this should be a quick one for you, Dr. Fazelli. How long should pituitary and thyroid function be monitored after surgery and radiation? Is it forever or is there a point in time where it could stop? Um, we monitor patients at least yearly forever after radiation therapy. Um, and that's because there is about a 30% somewhere between a 30 and a 50% chance of pituitary hormone loss after radiation therapy. And the longer out you are from radiation therapy, the more likely it is to occur. So if a patient doesn't develop it, we continue monitoring them. Okay, so it can be one of those late effects of radiation that may not show up for a few years. Exactly. Okay. Um, and that is, uh, oh, a new one, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, so are there any is there anything that would differentiate chronic permanent fatigue or fatigue from one hour at a time to another? Or is is that what you generally see with fatigue that you may feel fatigue one hour and next you feel fine and then you're fatigued again versus just steadily a steady uh, amount and rate of fatigue? Yeah, so, you know, like pain, uh, patients can have just kind of a low level that's occurring all the time that, um, you know, regardless of the activity or what they're doing, it's just something they always have, but that can get acutely worse by certain situations, events, activities. Um, so uh, the answer is any of these symptoms lasting for more than three months is considered chronic, um, but you can have different levels of intensity with different things that um, modify or uh, worsen that symptom. Okay. Um, 
question for Dr. Fuseli. Um, patients travel from all over the country to come to UPMC for surgery, Cordomo patients. And so you may see them for some kind of evaluations uh, before treatment, after treatment, and maybe at some follow-ups. But of course, they need probably need to have an endocrinologist or neuroendocrinologist at home. Um, how, how can, and that's the case, you know, for, for many patients is that they travel for their treatments. So um, what ways do you help patients get connected to someone locally or can you help them? And should they be looking for a certain type of endocrinologist such as a neuroendocrinologist or how do you help them uh, manage that? That's an outstanding question. So we do um, see the patients when they come in for surgery. We see them at, at the time of their initial evaluation and we'll see them in follow-up and they usually do come back for follow-up evaluations um, with our um, outstanding neurosurgical team, as well as um, potentially with radiation oncologists as well. Um, and so we will do an evaluation every time they come to UPMC, but I will work very closely with um, an endocrinologist that the patient identifies at home and will communicate um, what needs to be done in order to optimize that patient's endocrine management long-term. So we can do the evaluation and then I can help guide an endocrinologist at home. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, someone who specializes in pituitary endocrinology because we can help, help with that management and help guide them and, and explain what we think needs to be done um, when they're at home and not at UPMC. Great, thank you. And final question, really, um, I think I could get perspectives from both of you. Um, what can patients do to prepare themselves for a meeting with their medical provider regarding their fatigue? Um, for instance, um, keeping a journal uh, of, of how they're feeling and what type of, you know, what activities are causing the fatigue, um, anything else like that that can just uh, help patients understand what's going to um, be best when they meet with their doctor. So um, Dr. Roland, you, we could start with you. Yeah, you know, anytime that you can provide more information for us, um, the better. Um, I, I think I always want to get a good sense of what you felt like at baseline before uh, your diagnosis and what kind of activities you were able to do. And to um, and then the pattern um, of it, as as was uh, recently asked, and if there's been any recent events like changes in medication um, uh, or medical, you know, common medical events like heart disease or um, COPD, um, you know, these are all things that need to be uh, considered. So um, I don't think that uh, fatigue um, assessment should be limited to the oncology team. Um, you know, as, as is clear here, it takes a, a whole lot of expertise. And so common things being common, we really need to make sure that we rule those things out first, especially the bad players. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, modifying factors, what makes it better, what makes it worse, and what things have you tried? Right. Dr. Fazzelli, anything to add? Yeah, I agree with everything Dr. Roland said. In addition, I think um, keeping a very keeping very careful track of what medications, and especially supplements and vitamins that you've taken over the counter supplements. Um, for instance, if uh, a medical oncologist puts you on dexamethasone and I measure a cortisol level and it's low, that would be very important for me to know because it might not be adrenal insufficiency. It may just be because of the dexamethasone. Or if you're taking a supplement like biotin, biotin can interfere with our ability to measure thyroid hormone levels and can make it look like you have an overactive thyroid when in fact you have an underactive thyroid. So just keeping really careful track of all the medications, supplements, over-the-counters, um, topical creams that you're using makes our job a lot easier and will allow us to help um, the patients come to an answer about what might be causing their fatigue. Very good points. And that, that inter the medications uh, is an interesting point I hadn't come across before. So I will be sure to add that to our 
to the page on our website that has information about this as something uh, to keep track of when you talk with your doctors. Um, so um, we have uh, made it through uh, all but two questions um, that were a little more uh, narrow um, that I will be glad to send to the speakers. So the two people who, um, uh, if, if you're out there and your question didn't get answered, you submitted it anonymously, please um, email support at cordoma.org to, um, uh, and, and let me know the question and I'll be glad to email the speakers to uh, try to get an answer um, for you there. And um, before we go, um, I wanna mention just for everyone, a few ways to stay connected with us and with each other. There's resources on our website for getting information and assistance from our patient navigator. Um, as well as getting one-on-one -on -one support uh, from a peer guide through our Peer Connect program, and then connecting with others through our online community, Cordoma Connections. If you have not yet taken the Cordoma Survivorship Survey, which has been a wealth of information for us about the quality of life issues that are experienced by Cordoma patients and caregivers um, after a diagnosis, it is that survey is closing this Friday. So if you haven't taken it um, and you'd like to, please, um, go to our website and find the link on the homepage. And of course, make sure you sign up for our um, newsletters if you're not already, so we can keep in touch. And check our website for um, dates and topics for upcoming um, webinars in the virtual conference series this year. The next one will be an Ask the Experts uh, Q&A session. Um, we do these every time at our in-person community conferences and we did a virtual one last year and so this one will be July 22nd. Uh, registration will open in the next couple weeks for that so please be on the lookout. Um, and one final huge thank you to our speakers. Um, really happy that you were here with us today. It was very valuable um, and thank you so much for all of you for joining us and um, everyone take care. Be well and we'll see you in July for Ask the Experts. Thank you.